Hello everyone, welcome from wherever in the world you are right now. Uh, welcome to our panel on authoritarianism and public health in times of pandemic. My name is Philippa Thomas, I'm going to be moderating and this session is all about evidence of authoritarian leadership and behaviour in some of the countries that are not in the global headlines at the moment, but nevertheless, where there is evidence of the manipulation or suppression of information about cases of coronavirus, uh, of heavy-handed behaviour during lockdowns, of attempts to silence dissenting voices, perhaps even more than there have been before, and perhaps all of the above. In, in general, the exploitation of this public health crisis in order to gain or extend sweeping powers. We're going to bring you three different perspectives from Cambodia, from Venezuela, and from Kenya, talking about sub-Saharan Africa. I'm also going to be inviting your questions. As questions come in, they'll be curated. And at the end of the short presentations from our speakers, uh, I'll try to bring some of your questions in to them. Let's begin with just a short overview from our different guests. I first want to invite Mu Sokua in Cambodia to give us just a brief idea of how coronavirus is gripping her country. Sokua. Yes. I'm Musoku. I'm the vice president of the Cambodia Party. In Cambodia, it, it, there are 122 cases of affected cases, zero deaths. However, Mr. Hun Sen, the Prime Minister of Cambodia, the legitimate Prime Minister, who is the world longest serving, dictator, is using this as his perfect storm to put more power into his hands. As of February, early Feb February, Mr. Hun Sen himself said, coronavirus will not come here until February 31st, which earns him the nickname of Mr. February 31st. Not only that, he said, because coronavirus comes from China and China is our best friend, we have to show to China the full support what we have to endure with China. He had refused to graduate the students in Wuhan who begged to be reunited. He had accepted a uh, cruise ship over 2,000 passengers to dock in Cambodia. He went to Beijing to show support to President Xi Jinping, his best friend. And all of, all of a sudden, now he is saying there is pandemic. We have to address the, this issue. And he created, and he's the chair of the National the Cambodian National Committee and COVID 19. Now he is calling for, and the law on the state emergency law has gone through the one party. Um, National Assembly or the Parliament of Cambodia are waiting for adoption any time. Thank you very much for that uh, starting thought. We'll hear a little more from you, of course, in just a few minutes. Uh, Miguel Pizarro in Venezuela, would you give us an idea of what it's like right now on the ground? Well, Venezuela is an emergency in the emergency. Uh, COVID-19 arrived to a country in the middle of an humanitarian emergency. In Venezuela, one third of the population doesn't have access to the minimum amount of calories or the level of food they need on a daily basis. We have a country where almost 5 million people have fled the country already. And if we add those numbers in, in one calculation, the, the number of people in humanitarian needs and the number of people in refugee condition, that's half of the population. Right now, Venezuela is also struggling against a police state. Maduro's regime is trying to use COVID-19 outbreak to concrete and to go deep in, a, in the ways of have social and political control over the population using the basic needs. And right now, all the health personnel, the NGOs, the politicians, even the National Assembly, the last institution with legitimacy in the country, are under a big harassment of the regime, trying to avoid the truth to be told, trying to hide the real numbers of the COVID-19 in Venezuela and using the pandemic to grip to power and to increase the level of political and police control over the population. Miguel, thank you for your opening thought. We're going to go to Nanjala Niabola 
uh, and I should say about Nanjala, uh, she is um, subject to there's a rolling electricity blackout, so we may hear her without seeing her. She may pop up every now and then. There's rainstorms, I think, and electricity problems. But Nanjala, if you can hear us, would you give us an opening thought about uh, what's happening where you are? Um, thank you, Philippa. I think for me, I would just like to lift up the countries that are, you know, constantly flirting with authoritarianism, and we are at a, a very vulnerable moment because we're seeing countries doing the, uh, an overreach. Um, and the three trends that I wanted to point out with regard to this overreach as vulnerabilities that need to be paid attention to in countries that are always ranked as partially free or almost free. Um, the one is a misuse of emergency powers. So we we have in countries like Uganda. Um, whereby it goes from peacetime uh, to extreme measures of uh, empowering the police to arrest people, to detain, we've seen LGBTQ plus communities targeted by emergency uh, directives that are not passed through legislation, that are not passed through parliament, that create en enormous vulnerabilities for vulnerable, uh, for, uh, vulnerable members of the community. Um, another piece that we're seeing is the militarization of responses, and this is the use of the army um, to implement public policy. And this has happened in South Africa. Um, we've seen this happen in Egypt, and we're seeing that the, the, the problem that comes in is that the military is not designed to be used as a peace tool. And so we're seeing um, um, disproportionate use of force against vendors, against people who don't really have the option to comply with stay-at-home orders, who don't really have the option to opt out to work from home. Um, and finally, the data information and surveillance and the, the sweeping collection of data um, amendment of um, uh, press freedom laws in order to allow the state to punish people for freedom of speech, for freedom of expression. This has happened in Kenya. Um, and so these are the three things that I would want us to pay attention to in these countries that are maybe not on paper quite qualified as authoritarianism, but certainly but authoritarian, sorry but certainly vulnerable and might use this opportunity, this uh, a pandemic as an opportunity to expand state overreach. Nanjala, thank you. Thank you all three for those opening thoughts. And just to say to members of the audience who are tuning into us now, you are hearing three perspectives from Cambodia, from Venezuela, from Kenya on authoritarianism or creeping authoritarianism uh, at this time of public health crisis. I'm going to give each of our speakers now the chance to present more of what they know so closely uh, whilst keeping an eye on the questions that are coming in. Um, the first speaker I'd like to go back to in Cambodia, Musa Kua, is, of course, the Cambodian pro-democracy activist and political leader. Uh, Sokua, can I invite you to tell us more about the evidence you are seeing about the way things are changing in response to coronavirus? I need to go back to 2018. Um, Mr. Hun Sen banned party illegal, but against the constitution so he competed by himself with himself at the election of 2018 so to us he's not a legitimate uh, prime minister so he to us what we see is he's seizing this moment the COVID-19 to pass the state emergency law so that he can legitimize his powers his his position as the prime minister of they will give him more power because he is going to use it in order to uh, stop the uh, the factory workers. We have over 800,000 uh, factory workers, mainly male. We have who survived on a vip on um, about two, two to three dollars a day, and they support three members families, meaning if they close, if the uh, factories are closed, they, um, the, about three to four million uh, lives will be affected. So Mr. Hun Sen is trying not to close the factories. He does not, he's not responding to the pandemic in terms of healthcare, in terms of lives of the people of Cambodia, but he's keeping so that he can support, he can keep the economy alive because there is no economic st stimulus packages uh, at this moment. He's forcing the workers to keep go to the factories. That's number one. Number two, we have close to two million uh, 
and Cambodian migrant workers in Thailand. And Thailand has also closed its borders, but uh, the workers are coming back to Cambodia. About 60,000 of them are coming back and have uh, continued to come back. So Mr. Hun Sen knows that these uh, migrant workers will also be jobless in Cambodia, will be where I'm could Jews could join the factory workers that will um, he cannot economic uh, crisis and he cannot not only that we have the um, like any other country um, the informal sector the poorest of the poor who depend depend on jobs and the low um, official low ranking officials service, they will be angry. So Mr. Hun Sen is using, he's protecting already, is forecasting push for, um, conditions when the pandemic will uh, hit Cambodia and longer control the pandemic or control the information. So what we are saying, think we are very afraid of is that well, he, the world will give Mr. Hun Sen the reason, will support Mr. Hun Sen, the reason more, give him more reason when they go, he will continue to after us. We are already in exile. Today they have arrested our people, our members already, our members are arrested every day. The um, last week, a reporter who reported the words of Mr. Hun Sen verbatim was related to COVID-19. He's arresting people, he is uh, destroying democracy already, but he needs legitimacy, he needs the state uh, emergency law to give him a reason to uh, more the arrest, and more, almost all of the arrests are done without any warrants, and disappear, there's no way of um, now we are very afraid that the world is not interested in Cambodia. Cambodia is already under force until um, recently, under the um, surveillance of, under the um, warning of the European Union for um, the uh, um, critical uh, human rights conditions related to um, privileges that. Cambodia has been able to benefit from the EU market for the past uh, years. So the situation is very, very critical. It's not about uh, create, and uh, we are very worried because uh, Cambodia economically cannot survive. The health situation, the health services, the public health services in Cambodia is not strong. There uh, is no uh, social distancing, no lockdown. We are not calling on lockdown. Yeah, we're calling on um, respect of human rights right? and uh, leave the, the Cambodian people a chance to contribute to the measures and in, in order to make the measures more adaptable, more humane, so that uh, as a nation survive this pandemic without having to go uh, to be treated as like us, we are being treated as traitors. We are to, we are outlawed, and this is not a way to uh, address the issue that is, well, it is affecting 16 million people in Cambodia. Sakur, thank you. We hear you. There are questions coming in already. I'm going to move to our other two speakers, but we are watching the questions and hope to bring several of them up at the end of this session. So now we're going to go to, to Venezuela. Uh, Miguel Pizarro, the Venezuelan representative to the United Nations, of course, for interim President Guaido. Uh, Miguel, if you would give us more of what you are seeing and, as we were just hearing, the state of public health infrastructure in trying to cope with this crisis. Yeah, Felipe, as I said before, we're saying this is Venezuela is an emergency in the middle of the broader emergency because we are going through this humanitarian catastrophe because of man-made uh, decisions. Uh, Venezuela right now have, is in the middle of a political breakdown because of the regime's decision. They took and they robbed the election of 2018, trying to destroy the National Assembly. I am one of the 33 members of the National Assembly who has been sentenced 
in the last 18 months. And that uh, forced a lot of us to be in exile and other part of us to be in clandestinity to, to remain hidden in embassies in Caracas to, to still doing the, the work we have to do. But COVID-19 arrived to a country where already we had a lot of problems. More of the half of the country doesn't have regular access to water. 80% of the country doesn't have regular access to electricity. Right now, 60% of the medicines the hospitals need it's impossible to find it anyway in the country. 70%, and it's important this number, 70% of the health institutions, the hospitals, doesn't have access to water, soap, and alcohol. The people in the health personnel, the first responders, are working in, in ways that is almost impossible to achieve. And the regime is trying to use the humanitarian situation as a hostage. Maduro's regime have a calculation. They feel that if they can resist enough the international pressure and they avoid to open a real humanitarian space and they force the international community to interact with them to ease the harm of the population, to release the suffering of the population, is the strategy they're developing right now. And, and with that in mind, they are sending letters to the IMF, but they don't want a real credit. They are trying to speak on behalf of the United Nations system, but they're not uh, being respectful of the humanitarian principles and the humanitarian response. They're trying to use their relation with Russia and China to make this a geopolitical problem, but we're becoming a real factor of disturbance in the whole region. And, and it's really important to understand that it's impossible in Venezuela to have a quarantine lockdown or social distancing in the way it's working in, in most developed economies, because in Venezuela, people don't have money to make an inventory for a whole week in their houses. People don't have electricity and water to remain inside the house with their whole family because they don't have the basic service. And the regime is forcing the lockdown and is forcing the quarantine using the FAES, using the Sabine, those are uh, special police corps and is using other repression to make the members of the media, the health personnel, the politicians to remain silent and not to tell the truth. The regime is telling two, two important lies, Philippe, and, and with this I will conclude this part. First, they are trying to use this as a propaganda of the health service and, and the way or, or the power they have of interaction in the world. And with these lies, they are condemning a lot of Venezuelans to to die because they are not saying the real numbers. They're trying to become in statistics the champions of the test and they're not doing enough PCR tests, only quick tests. And the second part is in the middle of the humanitarian situation, the regime is forcing the population to have a lot of more suffering because they're not opening the doors to the international assistance and to the real aid coming through the United Nations system. We are forcing and we're fighting to open a real humanitarian space and we're encouraging the UN system and the international NGOs to make more pressure to have a real response inside of the country. Miguel, thank you very much for your contribution, the power of that contribution. Your video has been going in and out a bit. Your voice has been clear. Your message has been extremely clear. Uh, more questions uh, coming in. Do keep them coming. But I want us to hear from our third speaker uh, next, and that's Nanjala Niabola, who is a, a Kenyan writer, lawyer, a political activist, uh, Ninjala, I know you're speaking about Kenya, but you are taking a wider perspective. So do tell us more about what you are seeing. Well, one of the things that I uh, would like people to pay attention to, and then you know, in this forum and beyond, is the vulnerabilities that this disease has has really emphasized and has brought into stark relief. Um, I think COVID-19 for many societies has just found the existing inequalities and found the existing social democratic uh, shortcomings and exacerbated them. So where there was a solid investment in public health and public awareness and trust between citizens and the state, we see a very robust response and we see a coordinated response. We see citizens listening when their government gives them direction. Um, but where we have deep inequalities of access to healthcare, of access to information, um, of a, set, a sense of uh, a disconnect between the society and the, and the civilians, um, then and the state, sorry, then we see a lot of uh, lack of trust, we see a lot of failing structures, we see a lot of anxiety, and we see a lot of vulnerabilities that are created precisely because um, we have regimes, we have administrations that have failed in other aspects, sort of overcompensating um, through these uh, militarization, use, use of police and other excesses of violence. 
And those are the things that I think people should really pay attention to. There are a number of countries in the world that we might not consider to be authoritarianism, at least where we, we imagine authoritarianism to be on a spectrum, but are actually incredibly vulnerable at this moment precisely because of all of these failures that have gone before COVID-19. And Kenya is a great example of this. I've been writing about police brutality in Kenya for many years. And so for those of us who operate in this space, it wasn't a surprise of the government that their first instinct was, let's use the police to, to um, punish the public for you know, breaking laws they didn't even know existed or they didn't even exist 24 hours before that. So we had um, a curfew that was passed and people were given four hours to adapt their entire working day around this curfew. And those who did it were tear gassed and beaten and arrested. Um, by the end of the first week of the COVID-19 outbreak in Kenya, the police had killed more people than the disease because we had children, we had a 10 year old child shot on the balcony of his own home. Like these are the excesses that I think a lot of societies um, that we might not ordinarily pay attention to are incredibly vulnerable to. Um, and also within that, you know, there are vulnerabilities for specific categories of people who have already been at the margins of the public of the of the society um like i mentioned in my beginning speech you know the lgbtq plus community um in uganda being targeted for arbitrary arrest and detention um based on public order laws that don't specifically single them out but um you know when you talk about no more than five people being allowed to gather at one place the, the lgbtq plus people who were arrested in uganda were in a safe house um, and so, you know, there's, there's a failure of interpretation, failure to explain the public order laws in a way that makes sense for the public benefit. Um, the language of war has permeated the COVID-19 response around the world, and I think it needs to stop. I think people need to realize that this is a crisis of care. This is a crisis of society. This is not a, a military crisis. And by using the language of war, we're encouraging these societies that are on the cusp to teach it towards authoritarianism, to appropriate you know, security language, to say, well, we can use the police in South Africa to beat up traders who are out, uh, outside in violation um, of the public order laws. We can beat them up because we're in a war. We're not in a war with this virus. We're in a, we're in a, a crisis of care. We're in a crisis of states failing to provide care for you know, their own societies, failing to invest in public health. And those are the things that we need to focus our energies and our attention for, lest we give these societies on the cusp the ammunition that they need to go over uh, the edge. Nandriala, thank you. Thank you all. Really powerful perspectives and information and insight that we're getting. A lot of questions coming in. I'd like to take the next up to 10 minutes to pose some of them to you. Uh, there are two or three coming in on the same line. I just want to read some of these contributions to you and then come to each of you. Um, so uh, Peter, for example, saying, is it reasonable to say that we're seeing the majority of governments in the world using COVID-19 to cement a non-democratic pathway of politics? Um, Tommy says, how do you think uh, these authoritarian regimes will use their power to declare states of emergency more easily in the future. And similarly, uh, a question here that I'll end on for now from Chloe. Will the coronavirus crisis help authoritarian leaders in this country to consolidate power? Or might their mishandling of the pandemic give the opposition an opening? And I will come to Miguel uh, on this point. Miguel, if you were able to hear those questions. Yeah, thank you, Felipe. I will start with the last one. We're trying, and President Guaido make a proposal in the beginning of the outbreak in Venezuela. It's impossible to have the funding, the kind of funding Venezuela needs in the future with Maduro usurping the presidency of the Republic. It's impossible to have access to the World Bank, to the IDB, to IMF, or even to a, big, a bigger response in the United Nations system, having Maduro's regime holding to power. And we make a proposal of a Council of State. We make the proposal of an emergency government, government with the army, with part of the members of the regime, with the National Assembly, with civil society, and with international actors, to not only to make a big response to COVID-19, also to start the rebuilding of Venezuela. It's impossible to get out of this economical situation without a real political change. And we're trying to open that path in Venezuela. Without any doubt, and answering to the first question, this is the, uh, an Orwell dream for a lot of authoritarian regimes. This is the dream of the big, the big Brother. 
having big data to monitor all the people, having all the access and all the information of all the, the, the transit or, or even any kind of attempt of transportation inside of a country and having the police state in place to hold to the power uh, uh, with more power. And, and they're saying, uh, we are going to get back to, normal, to normality after COVID-19, but it's going to be a monitored normality. And, and that's what they're trying to do. We have to stop it. And I think this kind of spaces and discussions are really useful for that purpose. Miguel, I'm going to follow up with you as I have you, both in audio and video, and partly because a question has just popped up for you. Do you, says uh, Sergio, predict serious social unrest riots in Venezuela as people's suffering increases over the coming weeks? Yeah, we, we already are starting to see that in the, in the past two weeks because we are in the middle of a mix of, of situations. We have COVID-19 and the forced lockdown the regime is trying to do, who is impossible to, to achieve because the people doesn't have food and water. We have also shortage of gasoline fuel. 90% of the country is without gasoline and that make all the producers and the workers impossible to go to their stations to work. And third, uh, half of the population doesn't have food without gasoline and without the internal transportation working in the, in the way it should, the people is not having access to the basic uh, supplies they need. And we're having, we're in the middle of two weeks of important demonstrations, small ones, but in the poorest slums, and the people is starting to fight against, against authority. We're trying to, to make the people understand that they have to, to remain safe and remain healthy, but we're also encouraging to, to raise their voice and to demand what is right, that is the access to the basic needs and the basic coverage. Thank you. Uh, Sokua, I can see you now in Cambodia, uh, or we're talking about Cambodia. Uh, Tithia has sent a question about the health ministry reports in Cambodia saying there are, I think, as you said, 122 cases. Uh, do you think this is a truthful report? Is it verified by the WHO? Sakua. WHO and the um, Center for Disease Control in the US are working closely with the government of Cambodia. Now, the, the, as the past two or three days, there have been zero cases of uh, infections. Um, uh, the infected uh, cases are very low, 122 for 60 million. Now, the, and we know that there is no social distance um, implemented, uh, encouraged, encouraged, but not enforced, no lockdown, not that we lockdown, but there are there is, um, about 1,000 um, test done already for a population of 16 million. So it is really incredible that Cambodia uh, has no case past two or three days consecutively. What is it that is going on? We hope true. However, we want we know that there are cases where, um, for example, Chinese um, people who came to Cambodia were the hundred thousand in Cambodia within their casinos um, where if some of them were affected in infected yeah and then they were not tested until they went to Wuhan they went back home to China and they were uh, found infected so um, uh, there is social um, uh, tracing of the facts in quite um, see how uh, there is something that is not that's not um, totally telling us the truth. We want, the truth can help us to prepare for the situation, for the real the, um, um, uh, pandemic. What we are very concerned about is the, is the safety of the women who are, again, 800,000 in the factories. We're very concerned about by, with the population in the slums, we are concerned with uh, because the healthcare system is so poor. We're concerned because uh, the elderly, elderly, the disabled people have not received any proper care. So, in 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 a nutshell, what we want we want a whole population. We want measures that are uh, that take into consideration um, rights of the people. We want. All 
credible, transparent information, and we want the participation of uh, the people in taking the measures for their own lives. And us in the opposition, we have no voice whatsoever, and that we find uh, unacceptable because our people, we are people are in Cambodia, and they need to be um, receiving the the right information, the right services, the he right help and care. We are afraid of political uh, discrimination when uh, our people are affected. That would be a disaster. I'm very afraid of Cambodia, of, of Mr. Hun Sen, relying almost totally on China for aid in the future. We are very afraid of a... Uh, a so, good. Uh, thank you. Uh, we're just, we're just breaking up a little bit there, but thank you for your response. I have a, a final question that I would like to put to Nangala, who's a... I think still with us, Nanjala. I think you're still with us on audio. We had a question from oh, yeah. Youssef Tufan. He says, in times of crisis, how can governments find the balance between being transparent and keeping some information secret so the population doesn't go into panic mode? Your take on this? I think that it's very uh, unfair to the public to assume that giving them the right amount of information will make them panic. If anything, giving the public um, information allows them to make informed decisions, to understand why certain measures are being taken. I think now that, for example, in Kenya, we've seen this upswing in public information through community radio, uh, translating health messages, community health workers, we're actually seeing people being more responsive to the government measures, as opposed to the first people who are just being told, stay home, you don't need to understand why, and if you don't do it, the police are gonna get you. I think trusting the, the especially in these, uh, in, if you're trying to build a democracy, trying to build a functional democracy, I think information is important, especially, again, let's stop thinking about this as a security crisis or as a war crisis. This is a crisis of care. This is public a public health problem. And the old, good public health begins with an informed, polity with an informed society and i think you know stop there's no there is no information in my view that pertains to public health that needs to be secret um there's nothing that people don't need to know about it's their bodies it's their communities it's their societies by all means give them more information and i just wanted to loop back to the first question that um, that was asked um about um you know how the governments are, are responding i think one thing that human rights organizations need to be helping um, people agitate for or people organize for is to have sunset clauses on these public order laws is to say that you know two months three months after the last case is announced these uh, or one month after the last case is announced these public order laws will no longer be valid what we're having is open-ended legislation grabbing at all of these freedoms and there is no sense of well when does this emergency end it's important to note, for example, in Kenya, that our public order law was passed in 1950. So this is a colonial law that was passed in order to control uh, the African population that was at the time fighting for independence. It's never been repealed. It's barely been amended. It's being invoked, you know, in a completely different context. And this is a law that gives police tremendous power and security services tremendous power. So, you know, as we're thinking about the balance between um, lawmaking and public health, one thing that we should definitely start thinking is how do we build in sunset clauses? How do we build in end dates into some of these laws? And how do we get people organized to be able to demand that as a measure of saying, you know, I'm going to give up my freedom, but only for this long and you have to give it back. Nanjala, thank you. And that's a very strong and practical point on which I think to end this session as we have activists and commentators and citizens from around the world tuning in. Nanjala Miguel Sokua, thank you very much for joining this session on authoritarianism and authoritarian tendencies in a time of pandemic. And thank you all for watching. Thank you. Thank you.